Blair Van Valkenburg and I'm a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at UCLA. Okay, Blair, can you start out by telling us how you became interested in vertebrate paleontology? Well, I was always had trouble figuring out sort of which natural science I wanted to pursue. I knew I loved the natural sciences, but I liked geology, I liked biology, I thought I wanted to learn about astronomy, I wanted to do it all. And I didn't, as an undergraduate, I did do some geology and some biology, and then there was a faculty, there was a class in vertebrate paleontology, which I took, and I realized that vertebrate paleontology kind of allowed you to go in many directions, and so it was, uh, that was the kind of flexibility I wanted. Yeah. Okay, can we go now to your um, current research and maybe a couple of contributions that you've made to the field that you think are maybe among the more sim right. significant? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, well, currently the research I have in my lab is sort of goes in two different, I'm sort of schizophrenic. There's one whole approach that it, uh, study that's going on on the nose of mammals and the mm -hmm. inside and the study of olfaction and respiration, uh, the parts of the skull that are involved in respiration and olfaction. And that involves a lot of high resolution CT scanning. And then on the other hand, uh, there is the study of ecosystems through time. I'm particularly interested in understanding what the Pleistocene was like before everything went to hell in a handbasket around 12,000 years ago um, to give us a better understanding of sort of the potential of what this planet could be, mm -hmm. <laughs> not that we could get back there. And I'm also interested in looking at big sort of macroevolutionary patterns of evolution, mm -hmm. specifically in carnivores. And I think the things that I'm most excited about in terms of what I discovered over my lengthy career here would be the, the, the discovery of this sort of macroevolutionary ratchet that seems to affect large, highly carnivorous mammals and sort of where you have selection for something at the individual level that ultimately is negative at the clade level and that was really exciting discovery. And um, also the idea that, and the realization that the study of something as simple as tooth fracture could give you insights into predator prey levels in ancient ecosystems and the whole dynamics of an ecosystem. That was really a, a surprise to me. <laughs> yeah. Now, in the course of your career, you've had, um, you've certainly mentored students, but I'd, I'd like to know now who has, was, would you consider yeah. your mentors? Yeah, yeah, I knew you were gonna, you, this question, I had to think about this question, not so much that I don't know, I was just, as I thought about it, all the mentors in terms of the physical mentors, the teachers, the professors, they were all men, <laughs> I realized. You know, starting with Roger Wood, as an undergraduate at Stockton State College. And then when I went to Johns Hopkins, oh, there was Steve Stanley, there was Jeremy Jackson, there was Bob Bakker even, um, and one female professor, Sally Wooden. And then as a postdoc, I was with Alan Walker. Mm -hmm. So in terms of those were the mentors, but then thinking about women that influenced me, others that influenced me, um, coming from books that I read, I would have to say that Ruth Ewer, the author of the Carnivore book, was a a supreme influence and that mm -hmm. book um, was of major importance. And then re the realization that Tilly Edinger, that there was this first woman that ever was in the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology and she actually studied a little bit of hoplophonia, so fossil named rabbits and brains mm -hmm. and things and I was impressed by that. So even though I never knew her, she was out there as a, as a ghost mentor, I yeah. guess, of sorts, yeah. yeah. Um, and my next question kind of comes from uh, what you just said, and, and it pertains to advice that you would maybe give to students that were thinking about going into VP. Mm -hmm. Well, if they're thinking about going into VP, you mean uh, in terms of the sorts of training they should have, right. it, it's great if they can acquire both geology and biology background while they're mm -hmm. undergraduates, but they can often pick up one of those as mm -hmm. a graduate student. Um, they should. I think I could give advice more about if they become a paleontology graduate student and they have whatever their project is, right. they should learn as much as possible about the organisms that they're studying. Or, mm -hmm. And if they can, of course they're studying extinct things, but mm -hmm. they should understand as much as possible about their modern relatives, mm -hmm. how they behave, how their biology, their ecology, um, so as to better interpret whatever they're looking at and put it in a larger context. Right, I think that larger context is incredibly important. Absolutely. Too many people just focus on the 
you know. Yeah, many times they get focused on the method and the right. new method that they're right. using and they sort of lose sight of the mm -hmm. question and then when they are puzzled by their results, they don't have a larger framework to put it in and say, oh, I should have go back and ask the question this right. way or I should go collect data over here mm -hmm. or this is what's really interesting about it because they have a deep knowledge mm -hmm. of right. the organisms and the ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, yeah. how about some of the challenges that you've faced and overcome and maybe lessons that you've learned from right. confronting them? I, I think being resilient is mm -hmm. one of the most important things, being persistent. I think one of the hardest things is, A, getting a job as a vertebrate paleontologist. There aren't that many of them. And you, mm -hmm. I think flexibility in that sense, and if you're, if you're at, as a graduate student, at a place where you have an opportunity to teach human anatomy and learn human mm -hmm. anatomy, that opens up an avenue for postdocs that you can have or ultimately even mm -hmm. positions. So that broadens your mm -hmm. opportunity. So that's a good idea if you can do that. But also then one of the hard things is funding. It's, it's just, it's difficult to get mm -hmm. funding. And so you have to be willing to try and try and try again. And you have to also um, avoid distraction. So as a, as a woman, even as a graduate student, and then if you have a postdoc or faculty position, women are often called upon to serve on committees and do various outreach cap, cap, um, activities, which we want to do because we want to serve as role models, but it can be a bit excessive. And for young women especially, I think they have to keep their eyes on the prize and go for their focus on their research mm -hmm. and do some of those opportunities, but try to keep them to a minimum, always focusing on the, the goal because it's Getting a PhD is much harder than you think it is. The writing mm -hmm. takes much longer than you think it will. And uh, so it's important to just keep your eye on that prize and keep working towards it. Okay. I know you've been attending these meetings for a very long time. Right. Maybe you could kind of reflect on some of the changes you see, you know, from previous to now mm -hmm. that, you, that you notice about the, the meeting and the size. Of course, the obvious thing that's changed is the size, but also it, the society has become much more diverse. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a really positive thing. Right. And there are many more young women at these meetings than there used to be. It was quite lonely, I think. <laughs> yeah, and in terms of some of the physical, the f physical female mentors that I might have had, they were often um, because they weren't faculty yet. They were more senior graduate students than mm -hmm. me. So people like Christine Janis mm -hmm. and people like Annalisa Berta <laughs> were, were sort of mentors or at mm -hmm. least models for me as a younger graduate student. So seeing, seeing um, lots more women here, I think is a really positive thing and, and more diversity all around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. it's great. That's, it's just gotten busier and larger as what, and more mm -hmm. concurrent sessions. That's kind of the negative part of it. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly, right. yeah. Although it's exciting that there's so much research going mm -hmm. on, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really important to have a committee, uh, <laughs> which you will have as a PhD student, but to know that committee and use that committee and rely on them, all of them, mm -hmm. and don't, if possible, don't just necessarily focus on your advisor, because sometimes things can go awry mm -hmm. and you need, um, other advice, mm -hmm. and it's important to have those other people. Certainly in my experience, it was very important. Um, I guess another thing you would say about being a PhD student, yeah, and the resilience, is there are going to be times when you feel very um, down about your PhD, yeah. either that it's never gonna get done, or we all set such high expectations for what we want to discover and we think we're going to discover. And then when it's not quite, you know, you didn't solve all the world's problems or you didn't find that great thing that you hoped you would find, students tend to get like mm, deflated and then they don't think they want to publish or they don't even want to talk about it because who could care less? And, and you have to go beyond that and just give your talks because what always happens is people come up to you and say, wow, that was really interesting. And so even though you are your, your worst critic frequently, mm -hmm. so believe in yourself despite what you're thinking, <laughs> believe in yourself and give those talks and present your work and publish your work because it will be well received. Yeah, and this is a very supportive, encouraging environment yes. at a professional meeting like this. Yeah, yes. yes, yes. In fact, yeah, I brought a new graduate student here, and he was just um, very happy to mm -hmm. get the support that he was getting, and has already written me and thanked me for oh, introducing him and, and mm -hmm. to people, and mm -hmm. he's just 
all charged up yeah. about well, I think we his all come, future. We yeah. all come back from the meeting charged, well, yeah. exhausted, but charged up about the science. <laughs> yes, the combination of being exhausted and then stimulated about mm -hmm. new things you want to do, right. and yeah, that, you're, that you learned at the meeting and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm.